got it.
Good evening, everyone. Welcome back. Glad that you came. We're always glad to get back together for worship service. And I was telling my class this morning that uh, I imagine most of you share the same feeling I do, that uh, we're encouraged every time we come together. We're encouraged from the strength we gain from fellow Christians, and that's the way it's supposed to be. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of sad when we have a lot of empty pews and know that our brothers and sisters should be here but are not. But uh, I'm glad you're here and just want to encourage you to look around and see who, who should be sitting in front of you or behind you and give them a call and just tell them we miss them. We love them and we miss having them here with us in worship. A uh, quick rundown of the sick list. Wanda Worley, the mother of David Worley, is having uh, health issues and uh, will probably have to go to Nashville to have treatment for those problems. Dolly Versey fell and broke her hip three weeks ago and is currently at Lakeway. Drew Haas, the nephew of Scott Chambers, is in need of prayers. Daryl Dunn, the brother of Patty Palmer, is home from the hospital. However, his condition is very serious. We're glad to hear that Bonnie Dunlap will be coming home tomorrow, settling back in at, at home. And uh, also, I want to remember Jerry Waldrop as she goes back to Paducah for another procedure tomorrow. Additional announcements, the after-school program is needing volunteers to help in the homework uh, with the kids on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Now, this is not, uh, if you have an interest in doing that, you don't need to feel like you're going to get trapped into something the rest of your life. Even if you can just spend an hour on any one of those days or all three of those days, any time that you can dedicate to that will be a help to them, helping the kids with their homework when they arrive from school. So if you're interested, uh, talk to Linda Janice or Laura Henson. The annual Elder Deacons Minister meeting will be next Sunday at 4 p.m. in room 52. So we need to mark our calendars for that. The young people will be going to Mike Miller Park immediately after service tonight for the fireside singing. I hope Nathan has a big fire going out there. It's going to be needed. Also, on the 27th, we will host a youth rally. And I, I assume that's the potluck following the youth rally during the worship period. Is that the way it's going to work? Youth rally and potluck for the area youth. Uh, that's going to be the 27th after our, or during the evening service and then immediately following the service uh, have a potluck for all those who attend and everyone's encouraged to bring soup, chili, crackers, drinks, and or desserts. Those are the only announcements I have except that this flip phone was found in the circle drive out there this morning. If anybody left a, lost a flip phone, uh, I'll leave it up here for you. Uh, the battery hasn't run down so apparently it's been used recently. Um, Jim, I guess, going to be leading singing tonight. Okay, let's all join together and worship God as we have uh, Jim leading us in singing. There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless way. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed touch of the light. Yep. 
heard the Macedonia call today. Send the light, send the light, and the golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light, send the Pray that grace may everywhere abound. Send the light, send the light, and the Christ-like Spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light, send the light, and bless the cross. not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown of love. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessing God's this song we'll have our opening prayer. <coughs> what a fellowship, what a joy divine, <coughs> everlasting heart, what a blessedness, what a peace is mine. from all of arms. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how Right the path rolls from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms.
Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for all the blessings we have in our lives. We, as we come here this evening to worship you in spirit and in truth, Father, we know that there is no greater blessing than that of your word and your love, that of salvation through Christ and his sacrifice for us. Father, we thank you so much for that, Father. But we also thank you for the physical blessings we have on this life, Father. We are truly blessed, more blessed than we realize most of the time, Father. We ask that you be with each of us as we go through our day and help us to not only appreciate the things that we have, Father, but help us to look for those around us that maybe need a little help or need a little spiritual, physical something. Help us to always be open to the opportunities that enter our lives, Father, where we can help others. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here and help us to worship you as you would have us worship, Father, and help us to have our minds centered as we should. Father, we know that there are those that are not here this evening that maybe it's physical illness, maybe it's some other thing that's keeping them away, Father, and we ask that you be with them, Father, and help them, and, and we ask that they return to us as soon as possible. Father, watch over us as we go through our lives. We fail you, Father, more often than, than we should. But we ask you to forgive us of those sins, Father, and continually bless us as we go through our lives and help us to always do things in accordance with your will as best we can and always strive to draw closer to you in what do we do. Help us, Father, to always be a shining example to those around us. Be with us through this service, Father, and help us to do all things in our lives according to your will. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand for the next song and remain standing for our scripture to follow. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way grows but clear. For I'm in the glory land way. Let's to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the glory land way. Wonders come on, oh, hasten to obey, for I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in Onward I go, rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him on that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grows but clearer for I'm in the glory land way. The scripture that has been chosen for tonight is Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. You may be seated. Good evening. It is good to see everybody here tonight. It's kind of dark and dreary today. 
good napping weather. Hopefully you got all your naps out before you came to church tonight. Uh, as we get started, I got a little bone to pick. I um, talked to my Sunday morning sermon this morning about how I had trouble making soup. And then Sonny got up and said that we need everybody to bring soup to the uh, pantry. And then he got up a little bit later and said, by the way, later this month, we need everybody to bring soup to the youth rally. So I guess I need to say I can't make steak. That way we can have steak next time. Perhaps that's what we'll do. Uh, did everybody bring a coin tonight? Oh, everybody's looking. All right. This is better than special contribution night. All right, so we got everybody together. We'll get to the coin here in just a little bit. Now get us to Colossians 1.15. To get us there to that point, let's talk about this word image that you see in 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 1 and verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. The question that you run across all through Scripture as we are working our way through is, who is Jesus? Who is it that we're talking about? You go into Matthew chapter 16, you begin reading there, and it says, When Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? Peter responds, he says, Well, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, or one of the prophets. And uh, so Jesus says, Well, who do you say that I am? And Jesus, or Peter says at that point, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, or Jesus responds to Peter and says, Well, have you said, Simon Barjona, for upon this rock I will build my church. And there he names him Peter, which is the idea of a stone which will be there. So when we see that first confession, that first confession is upon the fact of the true identity of Jesus. The point of the entire passage is not that Peter is preeminent among the apostles or that he's a first pope or whatever different religious groups may teach. The point of the passage is the church is built upon the fact that Jesus is the Christ. So until you get the identity of Jesus straightened out, until you figure out that aspect of it, you can't really have church in the correct way. You can't identify who the church is. Well, even today, a lot of people say, well, who is Jesus? And what you see up here are a lot of different pictures. Some of them are more my favorite. Some of them not quite my favorite. We're probably familiar with the second guy over, the white Jesus, because of where we live. The funny one to me is the Chinese Jesus. I guess he's on our right. Chinese Jesus looks funny to me because I've never really seen Chinese Jesus hanging out. But if you're in China, you would think that our Jesus looks kind of funny because you would never think that Jesus was white. Because he is probably something what we'd see there on the left. Maybe you saw a show on National Geographic. They decided to go through DNA and look at the idea of what a man of Middle Eastern descent back in that time would look like. Somewhat like that. And so there's a lot of different pictures of, you know, what would Jesus look like? He would probably be somewhere in the range of five foot six. He'd probably be pretty heavy set as far as a build, being a carpenter, being a day laborer, which he would do. He'd probably have a pretty good sized beard. But the question is, who is Jesus? More importantly than the physical aspect of what Jesus would look like, we look across the spiritual aspect. And a lot of people have different ideas about who Jesus would be when we run across and look. Um, I tried to do, as I was getting ready for this lesson, a survey, going across religious groups. Um, the uh, Islamic, the uh, Muslim faith say, well, you know, Jesus is a prophet of Allah. He's not the prophet. He doesn't measure up to Muhammad. He's just one of many prophets. And they say he's equal to Abraham and equal to a lot of different people. Um, you go a little bit further, Buddhism, they say, well, he's not really a god. He's just a teacher. Hinduism says, well, yes, he's a god, but he's one of many gods. There's over 1,500 gods. And They'll allow Jesus to hang out in that pantheon there and hang out with everybody else. Judaism says he may have been a teacher, but he certainly is not the true Messiah. Jehovah's Witnesses would tell us, well, he is the Archangel Michael. As a matter of fact, he's one of the lesser gods who's around. Uh, the Mormons say that Jesus was born in heaven, that he's the spirit child of Elohim. Scientology, which is always a fun religion, I say that jokingly, L. Ron Hubbard made a lot of money off of it. But Scientology, he says that Jesus is a false memory which has been planted by aliens. So that's kind of a unique view of Jesus right there. But 
as you can see, you can go to a lot of different churches, and they're going to give you a lot of different pictures of exactly who Jesus is. And you can go and ask different people, and people are going to have theories left and right. They may have different theories about what he looked like, but more importantly, they have theories about what he fits in, exactly who Jesus is. What is he to each and every one of us? And so let's go to our next slide. As you and I look here at that word image in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, that word in the Greek is the word icon. Now, you're familiar with icon uh, probably today with computers and things such as that. If you belong to or if you are aware of some of the Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox religions specifically, you are aware of icons because they will put many of them within their church buildings in which you can pray to them and do different things. An icon is an image of something else. It's a, what we'd say today, a picture. And so this idea of a picture is what would be coming across when you and I think about what Paul is trying to say to us in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. He's an icon. He is the picture. He is what we can see of the invisible God. Now, go ahead and look at your coin. I came prepared tonight. I've got a quarter, I've got a penny, and I've got a dime. And one of those uh, things where you work through trivia, you've got to figure out who's on each one of them. As you think about this idea of a dime, I, I try to come up with some things that teach us about, you know, what can we learn from a penny? Or what can we learn from a coin? And here are some of the things that I wrote down when we think about it. When you look at a coin, you realize each one of us bears the image our maker put upon us. Each one of us has a purpose, and we bear the image of the one who made us. But over time, we can get worn down. Maybe you have a brand new penny, and it's shiny and everything. Maybe you have one that is worn down quite a bit. Even if it's worn, you can, as you look, eventually find out exactly uh, what it is, whether it's a quarter, whether it's a dime, whether it's a penny. Uh, each one of us has a beginning date, but we don't exactly know when the end is going to be. Now, I had my pennies and my quarters out here a little bit earlier as we were singing, and I was getting ready, and I was going to tell you the date on each one of these and talk about it, but I couldn't hold it far enough away to see the dates anymore, so we're not going to do that. But as far as I remember... There are dates on these. Uh, one is 1989, one is 1972, and I think the other one is somewhere in the 80s. Each one of our pennies, each one of our dimes, nickels, and quarters has a date upon it. And you can look and see exactly when that date will be. Now, how long will these things last? Well, there's different places, Philadelphia and other places such as that in Denver, where each one of these coins are produced. And after 20 years, after 30 years, they'll come through and they will be replaced by new ones. In the same way, each one of us has a date where we began, but we never know exactly when the end will be. Each one of our quarters and pennies and dimes say upon them, liberty. Now, in a sense, money gives us liberty. It gives us opportunity. But you find out pretty quick when you start doing the adulting, sometimes with money there's not as much liberty as you want there to be. And so even though we are told certain things, it doesn't always come to pass. And as we keep thinking about it, we see that a penny and a quarter and a dime and a nickel is not really worth very much alone. You remember when you used to be able to get a candy bar for just a few coins? You remember when you be, used to be able to get a gum ball for just a dollar or a nickel? It's kind of hard to do that nowadays, isn't it? And so each one of these really isn't as worth, worth as much as we want it to be. Some people, when they see a penny on the ground, don't even stop to bother to pick it up because a penny's not worth very much. But when you begin to put many of them together, when you begin to join them together they become much more powerful. That's the way the church is, isn't it? Sometimes we by ourselves are not as able to do things as we want to be able to do them, but as we're joined together with our brethren, we're strengthened and helped to be better and better. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And then, of course, every piece of our currency given by our country today says the phrase, in God we trust. 
And hopefully every time you spend money, whether it be at McDonald's, Walmart, or the electric company, you notice where it says, in God we trust, and it reminds you of what really, really is important. Money can be important. The things money can buy can be important. But the most important thing is God. And in God we trust. But as you look at this idea of icon, we look back in the Roman days, and the Romans had something going on here. It's something that they wanted to do. The Roman Empire had about 1.3 million people within the place. Of that 1.3 million, maybe only a few thousand had ever seen the emperor. But the emperor had a plan. He made sure his face was stamped upon every piece of Roman currency. And that way, whether you're in Jerusalem, whether you're in Greece, whether you're in Persia, whether you're in Egypt, even if you had never seen the emperor in person, you would have an idea of what the emperor would look like. Now, this is Julius Caesar hanging out on this coin here. Julius Caesar was bald, but since when you're king, you don't have to be bald on your coin. And so it didn't exactly match who Julius Caesar was, but it was the idea of saying, this is Roman power. Everything you spend, everything you use, you will see the emperor, and you will see the power of the emperor who is here. Well, Paul had used Roman money, obviously, being a Roman citizen and working in a Roman empire. And so he's very aware of this. And so as he begins here in Colossians chapter 1, beginning of verse 11 and going through verse 22, where he introduces us to the true Jesus and who Jesus truly is, his very first description is this. Jesus is the image of God. He is the one who shows us exactly who God is. When you and I read in our Bibles, we see at the birth of Jesus, Matthew chapter 1, looking around verse 20, let me see exactly where that passage is. Matthew chapter 1, as looking at verse 22. We see that one of the names of Jesus would be Emmanuel, which means this, God with us. And so let's go to our next slide as we look at this icon. And I want you to notice, when we look at the story of Jesus, how we see God. And very quickly, we'll just run through some of these things that you see. When you see Jesus, you see power. Here is a man who stopped a major storm with just a voice. Here is a man who saw 5,000 men and their families who were hungry. And so he broke apart a few fish and broke apart a little bit of bread and fed every one of them and still had 12 baskets to go. Here is a man who saw the dreaded disease of leprosy, reached out and touched and healed the people he saw with it. Here's the one who saw the widow of Nain's son, and he just touches the boy, speaks to the boy, and the boy comes to life. Here's the man who cries out at Lazarus' tomb, and Lazarus comes forth because everything in the end has to obey Jesus. And so what I want us to see is when we see Jesus, we see the power and the strength, the majesty and the glory of God. Jesus is God, and Jesus is man. He is the bridge that goes between us. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so when you and I think about Jesus, we think about his power, and that is a sign which is there. Now, going a little bit deeper, this is maybe a little off the beaten path. We see humor. God has a sense of humor. Now, my issue with jokes and sermons is I'm the only one who ever gets my jokes. But one of the things about Jesus is you see a lot of humor which is there. You remember in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, don't judge. You would think that in church we'd say just don't judge and just stare at each other and say, yes. Jesus goes beyond this, doesn't he? And he says, you know, the judgment you use will be used back. And he said, look at you. You're walking around trying to take the speck out of somebody else's eye. And what do you have in your own eye? We would say a railroad tie. He says a beam. You can imagine how silly this would sound at the time. Somebody walking around with a big beam in their eye trying to fix everybody else. Well, Jesus was good at using humor to get the point across. Jesus knew what it meant to laugh. He knew what it meant to be funny sometimes. He knew what it meant to kind of hit the funny bone, if you will. And as you and I look at Jesus, we see quite a bit of humor. 
We see at his birth, you see the star which is there and the wise men who come and Herod who's told that his kingship is about to be destroyed and all these things happening. How would you think that God would appear upon this earth? My view would be something like what you see in the Avengers when Iron Man comes and hits the ground and the whole world shakes. Or maybe you're thinking about Superman or the entrance of whatever it may be, whether it be Marvel or DC or whatever else. It's not how God works. God puts the most powerful being which has ever walked upon this earth in a manger. And nobody really wants him. God didn't send his son to be a great philosopher in Greece or a great soldier in Rome or a great pharaoh in Egypt. He sent him to the backwoods area of the entire world in a place where nobody would even recognize who he was. A place that nobody appreciated because really nobody wanted to be there. And it's amazing when we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2 that the foolishness of God is greater than the wisdom of man. And so as you and I look there at the idea of Jesus, we see a picture of God, a picture of the irony that God likes to use with each one of us to prove a point. You see, by our weakness, his strength is shown. That's why God takes sinners into the church. You ever notice perfect people are never added to the body of Christ? Because we have to admit that we're sinful. We have to admit that we need to repent. God takes sinful people. God takes poor people. God takes broken people to do his work, to do his thing. You see there the humor and the irony of God. Going beyond this, we see the kindness of God. In John 4, we see in the middle of the day, in the hottest time when nobody else would want to be there, Jesus standing at Jacob's well. And he sees a woman that you and I would be afraid to touch. This woman had been married so many times, she was living with a man, there was no telling in first century eyes what kind of diseases she would have. There's a woman who really was afraid to talk to anybody else. A woman who, even when Jesus began a discussion, she wanted to argue because she had been beaten down so much, she wanted to fight back, even if she didn't have a lot of room to fight back. And Jesus asked her for a drink. Now think about how powerful that is. Do you drink after people in your own home? If you see a kid who takes a drink, are you willing to take up that glass and drink it too? No, sometimes not, especially if the child's young, right? Even if the child's older, because that's gross. Imagine somebody you didn't even know being willing to drink after her. Imagine somebody who had been through life experiences that she had been through being willing to drink after her. What's Jesus getting across in John chapter 4? Jesus became one of us. And he's not going to let the barriers of culture. He's not going to let the barriers of sin. He's not going to let the barriers of embarrassment keep us away from him. He loves us that much. You go a little bit later in John chapter 11. Here is a woman thrown at the feet of Jesus. And everybody around her says, Jesus, this woman is caught in adultery in the very act of adultery. We need to stone her. We need to put her to death. Jesus runs all the accusers away. And he says to the lady, where are your accusers? And she says, they've all left. And he said, you go and you sin no more. Jesus has seen you and I in our weaknesses. Jesus knows our deepest sin. Jesus has read into our hearts. Jesus knows exactly who we are. But he shows kindness anyway. And he's not going to let those barriers of embarrassment, those barriers of regret, those barriers of sin keep us away. He relentlessly chases after us and wants us to be with him. And that brings us to that last point I want to look at, that idea of love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's a lot of pictures that God creates to try to show the love that he has for us. One of the pictures, which he used a lot with Israel, (coughs) and he uses with us as well, 
is the love that a father has for his son. You know, a lot of times boys really get excited when they find out they're going to have, or men get really excited when they find out they're going to have a boy. They think, man, this is going to be great. I'm going to teach them to play baseball, teach them to play basketball, we take them out hunting, and all these things. A lot of times men have a very close relationship with their sons. God takes that example and he says, that's how I feel about you. But in the human world, that doesn't always work the way it should. And so Jesus goes a little bit further. In the end of Matthew 23, he says, I'm just like a mother who wants to gather her babies up against her and hold them. And so there we see the love that Jesus has for us. But sadly, in our broken world, that doesn't always come across. And so we go a little bit deeper and we get to Ephesians 5 and we see where He says it this way. He says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also has loved the church. And he says, think about the perfect marriage. In that perfect marriage, the church is attached to Christ. And he says, that's the love that we have. But we're in a broken world. And we don't always see it that way happening, do we? And so we read in Hosea about a prophet who loves his wife, even though she's a prostitute, Gomer, even though she leaves him all the time. We see that unfailing love which is there. We read of another minor prophet, Jonah, the wrong way prophet, who always is running away. And we see where God constantly is working with Jonah, saying, I want you to be right. I want you to be faithful. I want an opportunity to bless you. We come to the New Testament again. And we see that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. We see Romans chapter 5 verse 8. While you and I were yet sinners, so also Christ died for us. When you and I look at this image, this icon of Jesus, what we are seeing is God's amazing love for every one of us. Now, this sounds weird, okay? Because it's counterintuitive to what I do and what you do as well. Nothing you do, nothing you do can make God love you less. You may be a sinner. Guess what? You are a sinner. You may have failed. Well, you probably have failed. You may not deserve heaven. God still loves you as much as the day you were born. And just as that prodigal son in Luke 15, God wants you to return. He wants you to be with him forever. And he has done everything in this world he can do to bring you back home. God loves you. And of course, as we look at the picture of Jesus, we see judgment. Romans 11 and verse 22. Consider therefore both the goodness and the severity of God. Yes, there are times we see Jesus cleaning out the temple. Yes, there are times we see Jesus saying the woes of the curses upon the Pharisees in Matthew 23. But that judgment always waits. That judgment always waits to that last second because his love is so, so wonderful. Let's go ahead and go to our last slide. What I want us to notice as we think about this word icon is a similar word. In fact, the very same word is found in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10. And there is a, I call them declensions. I don't know if that's the way you ought to say it or not. But let's go through the declension very quickly, okay? If you remember in Genesis chapter 1, right, verses 22 and 23, God made man and God made woman, breathed into their nostrils the spirit, right? God was made, or excuse me, man was made in the image of whom? God, right? Man was made in the image of God. If you read the bulletin article that came out today, you see a little bit of an aspect or a little bit of a study what it means that we're made in God's image, more or less, God, when we read that in Genesis 1, it's not really explained what it means that we're God's image. Uh, God doesn't have two hands, two legs, 
God doesn't have a face and a nose like we would think that. God is spirit, and those who worship him worship in spirit and truth, John 4, 24. So how are we made in God's image? We're different than a kitty cat. We're different than a dog. We're different than an ape. There's something about man that's different. The rational aspect, every one of us are called to worship. Every one of us worships something. There's something different about us. We are made in God's image. Now, of course, you get to Genesis 3. Man fails. Sin enters into the world. And that image is corrupted. Now we bring it a little bit further. Okay? So you think about that image. Go with me a little bit further. Now we get to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. We see that Christ came with us. And we see that Christ came in the image of God. You recognize that going again a little bit more? You read in John chapter 1, you see the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. You see in John 14 where Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have also seen the Father. So Jesus, in many ways, is that image of God. Now we skip over to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10. And we see that after we have put away lying, after we put away the things of the world, that stuff that we did before we were a Christian, now we are made in God's image. We are renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created us. And so here is Adam and Eve in God's image in fellowship with God. They fall. Jesus brings us back up, and now that we're added to the Lord's church, now that we're saved, we are once again in that image which is there. Now, that's one of those sermons that can be fleshed out, one of those sermons that may be a little on the deep side as we go through it, but this week in your personal Bible study time, think about the aspect of how that image, that icon, works as you go through, and those things happen. But... Looking at application here, we read in James, where James talks about those people who read their Bibles and don't do a thing in the world about it. Can you imagine waking up in the morning, getting out of bed, walking into the bathroom, brushing your teeth, and looking in the mirror and saying, wow, I look bad. Now, probably most of y'all can't imagine that, but it's happened to me before. You see yourself in the mirror and say, man, I've got issues. What do you need to do? Comb whatever hair is left. The less hair you have, the more important each one is. You need to wash your face. You need to do whatever it is that you can look presentable, right? That's the purpose that that mirror is there, is for you to work yourself. Now, as you read there in James 1, and also in James 3, he says there's a problem because many people look into that perfect word of God, and it works like a mirror. And they see where their shortcomings come. They see where their issues are but they walk away and they never apply it to themselves. When you and I became New Testament Christians, we are added to the Lord's church. We were pressed into the image of God. And the job that I have every day for the rest of my life is to try to more and more conform into that image of Jesus. The job that you have this week, what we need to focus on is in everything you do, whether it's your family, whether it's your work, whatever it is, conform yourself more closely to the image that God has for you. God is working within each one of us. God is creating within each one of us a mission and a plan that he has. He's given us all the tools we need to be able to get there. But it's up to you and I to make the decision to work in that way. Looking in review, when God sent Jesus, he designed Jesus as he came to this earth to be a perfect manifestation, to be a perfect image, to be the icon, the statue we could look at and recognize who God is. Why did he send Jesus? Because he loved us and he wants us to be with him forever. And we are called to live in his image. Tonight, if the invitation applies to you, tonight, if you need the prayers of the church, we invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.
please be seated. If you've not had opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper today, then that is prepared for you in the library if you'll go now and someone will assist you there. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Blessed I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Blessed I forget Gaston. Let's bow. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you so much for this day that we've had to come and worship you this morning and this evening. We ask that as, you know, if we learn uh, what we have learned, that we'll take it and we'll apply it to our lives as we go out to our work and to our schools, that others may see you through us and we can bring uh, people that may not know you to you, Lord. Um, at this time, we ask that you will... Uh, uh, be with us as we travel to our homes and places of stay, as you group travel um, to Fireside uh, and the ones traveling from Murray and wherever others may be traveling from that uh, we will uh, get there safe and as you group travel home also. 
Uh, Lord, we ask that you would be with the ones uh, sick and the ones in the hospitals. Doc, help the ones doctors attending to them. Uh, that all possible, Lord, that they will restore to full health if possible. We ask that you will be with the ones uh, that have lost loved ones recently, Lord, that you will uh, be with them and that uh, you will help them through this tough time that if uh, we know anybody that we can, um, that we know of, that we can uh, be with them and that we can uh, help them if we know. Lord, we also ask that you will be with the ones fighting overseas, that uh, if all possible, Lord, that they would return to their families safe and sound. At this time, Lord, we ask that you forgive us of our sins because uh, we fall short daily and we're sorry, but we ask that you will forgive us and we ask that uh, we will look to your word uh, for guidance uh, throughout this life so we can uh, be uh, closer to you and we'll stay away, for, uh, stay away from sin as much as possible. Uh, Lord, just be with us and guide, guard, direct us and we found faithful in, in the end while us will uh, we ask for a home in heaven with you one day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. He paid the fare. He did not owe. I owed a debt. I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sin away. And now I sing a brand new song, amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. He paid that debt at Calvary. He cleansed my soul and set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins of praise. I now can see a brand new song, amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. One day he's coming back for me to live with him eternally. Won't it be glory to see him on that day, I then will sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. You're dismissed.